बोलते हुए शर्म नहीं मिनिमाइज कर दो इसको वेलकम बैक एवरी वन नेक्स्ट अलाउ मी टू वेलकम द नेक्स्ट मॉडरेटर फॉर द सेशन डॉक्टर नीलाद्री प्रिंस एक्सपीरियंस I now invite our next speaker, Dr. Pooja Saxena, SOD Department of Anesthesia, AIMS, Mohali, who is widely known for her expertise and vast knowledge, which will undoubtedly elevate her intellectual discourse of the conference. Ma'am will be speaking on IV access bundle of care. good afternoon everyone and i would like to first of all thanks dr kavita and team for giving me this opportunity to talk about this lesser known lesser discussed topic iv access bundle of care uh the aim of intravenous management is safe effective delivery of treatment without discomfort or tissue damage and without compromising venous access especially if long term therapy is proposed you all must be aware of all the indications of the iv access which includes repeated blood sampling to administer the intravenous fluids medications chemotherapy nutritional support to provide the blood and blood products and radiological contrast so basically there are three types of uh, iv uh, cannulas the peripheral the pivc the midline catheters and the central venous catheter so what are the various sites uh, where the iv cannulation is preferred these include the veins of hand and the veins of the forearm uh, which include digital dorsal veins like the dorsal metacarpal dorsal venous network cephalic vein accessory cephalic the basilic the median antibrachial vein and so on so uh, what are the signs of a good vein the vein in which iv cannulation should be done should be bouncy it should be soft and should be above mentioned sites and it should be visible it should have a large lumen it should be well supported straight and easily palpable and the veins to be avoided should be uh, are the thrombosed sclerosed fibrous ones which we have all encountered inflamed bruised are not to be taken as uh, for iv uh, uh, cannulation uh thin fragile mobile the veins at near the bony prominences areas of sites of infection edema or phlebitis or the veins who have undergone multiple previous punctures are not to be taken so the uh, complications of iv therapy which include the local and the systemic complications uh, uh in which the the complication in which the iv was not properly placed in the vein this can lead to infiltration or extravasation of fluids and can even lead to phlebitis hematoma infection and all sorts of uh, complications the systemic complications uh, this may can this may be due to an inadequately secured peripheral venous cannula it might be due to dressing failure or due to catheter displacement which increases the risk of catheter related blood stream infections or cr bsi due to the pistoning action of the cannula in this the cannula moves back and forth and it can lead to um, uh, in drawing of the micro organisms into the vein so uh, sticking to my topic the bundle approach what is a bundle a care bundle is a set of evidence based practices that when performed collectively and reliably have been shown to improve the patient outcome it enhances the awareness of guidelines for cannulation improves the cannulation techniques according to the best practices available enhances patient care it maximizes the benefits of therapy 
and achieves and maintain a high quality of service. Dr. Pre uh, Peter Pronovost is accredited with developing the first care bundle, which was uh, related to insertion and management of the central venous catheters. So the bundle example for the short peripheral IV catheter insertion and post-insertion care, the components include, first of all, we need to assess the need for a peripheral intravenous cannulation, then maximizing the first insertion success, maintaining asepsis at insertion, dressing and securing the peripheral intravenous cannulation and review on daily basis and removal of the peripheral intravenous cannulation. So various guidelines uh, advocate a PIVC bundle should include the protocols to address all aspects related to the use of this device. And documentation finally is the key for peripheral intravenous uh, cannula management. So according to the uh, guidelines, best practice in the use of peripheral venous catheters, a scoping review, which was published in 2023, we need to have a documentation and protocols. And documentation and protocols is include uh, the need for defining indications for peripheral intravenous cannulation, use of a standardized insertion set for any cannula, defining or writing the local insertion protocols, use of ultrasound in difficult venous access situations defining uh, the local maintenance protocol and determine if the dressing needs to be changed. We need to define a local protocol for aseptic technique in the peripheral intravascular care. And we need to have a local protocol for catheter removal. This is all based on the various documentations and protocols. So uh, regarding the indication, the, it should be used for short-term IV therapies lasting up to seven days. This is the peripheral intravenous cannula. The insertion should be done by a person specifically trained for this task and not for, uh, to everybody can, uh, I mean, master this technique in a single day. And IV teams should insert peripheral intravascular cannulas in situation where a failed cannulation on the first attempt is expected. So this is the ideal insertion, uh, peripheral intravenous cannulation insertion set. So according to the EPIC-3 guidelines, the landmark, the national evidence-based guidelines for preventing healthcare-associated infections in NHS hospitals, uh, basically it requires elements of care process, which include um, the elements of care process during insertion of the peripheral venous cannula and during the ongoing care, that is the maintenance of the PIVC cannula. That means uh, insertion and maintenance. So both the evidence-based practices are required for both the processes. So in the insertion actions, we need to have, what all do we need to have? First of all, the foremost is hand hygiene. How do we do hand, hand hygiene? We are, I mean, just uh, simply uh, listening to, uh, to hand hygiene from the morning. So we need to decontaminate the hands before and after each patient contact and before applying examination gloves. This is uh, true for peripheral intravascular uh, cannula also, not just the central venous cannula. Use correct hand hygiene procedure, use of personal protective equipment, that is the gloves or the single use items, the gowns, the aprons, the eye face protection. Then we need to have the skin preparation for peripheral intravenous cannulation also with uh, use of 2% chlorhexidine gluconate in 70% isopropyl alcohol. And we should allow it to dry before uh, taking the prick. And if patient has a sensitivity, use a single patient use povidone iodine application. Then the dressing after the IV cannula is in situ uses sterile semi-permeable transparent dressing to allow observation of the insertion site. And finally, the documentation, the date of insertion should be recorded in notes. It should be documented. Then the PIVC maintenance uh, in, in this group, we need to have hand hygiene as well, decontaminate hands before and after each patient contact, use the correct hand hygiene procedure, now, site inspection is very essential. That is regular observation for signs of infection. At least daily uh, monitoring should be there. Then dressing, an intact, dry, adherent, transparent dressing should be present. That is not to be done. We should use a dry, adherent, transparent dressing. Cannula excess, use uh, while handling all the cannulas and the ports, we should use 2% chlorhexidine gluconate in 70% isopropyl alcohol and allow it to dry prior to accessing the cannula for administering fluids or injections. 
then administration set replacement we are giving fluids as well as blood so immediately after administration of blood and blood products it, the set should be replaced and all of the fluid sets after 72 hours okay the routine cannula replacement and replace in a new site after 72 to 96 hours or earlier if indicated clinically so the mandate is routine cannula replacement is to be done after every 72 to 96 hours and if venous access is limited that means the patient we are not matlab uh, they are very poor veins or fragile veins in it then the cannula can remain in situ if there are no signs of infection so a little bit about dressing and catheter fixation dressing as i mentioned before it should be sterile transparent semi permeable self adhesive polyurethane dressing and allows continuous observation not like this which is shown in this figure this is wrong and using a short extension set attached to the catheter can reduce the catheter movement because catheter movement uh, it initiates a piston movement and it leads to um, infection uh, the indrawing of the microorganisms in the iv cannula and replacement of dressing replace dressing every 7 days every 7 days if it is if the dressing becomes damp loosened no longer occlusive or adherent the excessive accumulation of fluid under the dressing utilize aseptic technique that is a and tt aseptic no touch technique during dressing change pack if there is any blood or ooze from the catheter insertion site it should be removed with sterile 0.9% ns okay and skin preparation as per insertion as we've already uh, seen that is it is to be done with 2% alcohol uh, chlorhexidine and 70% isopropyl alcohol or 10% povidone iodine if chlorhexidine is not there now keep documentation of everything it is very important for any bundle of care and what you need to document is the date and time of insertion of iv catheter the gauze size of the catheter which gauze size have you have put in the uh, patient's vein make type and batch number of the catheter site of insertion date and time of remo removal of the iv catheter reason for removal of iv catheter and indwelling time indwelling that is how for how much time the, the cannula was in situ so that is the indwelling time of the iv catheter so you need uh, you all need to document this <clears throat> then removal of peripheral intravascular catheters the peripheral intravascular catheters inserted under emergency conditions should be replaced should be removed as soon as they are no longer clinically indi indicated and thirdly most important phlebitis should prompt the catheter removal if there is any sign of phlebitis you should promptly remove the catheter this is the visual infusion phlebitis score and as soon as uh, it is uh, graded from 0 to 5 0 means no signs of phlebitis you have just to observe cannula do nothing just observe cannula in grade 1 there is possible first sign of phlebitis that is slight pain at iv site redness near the iv site you just have to observe the cannula then in second there is early stage of phlebitis and in this there all of the following signs are evident pain along the path of cannula erythema induration this is the medium stage of phlebitis and you have to recite the cannula and consider the treatment then fourth grading advanced stage of phlebitis and this is um, uh, in this there is pain along the path of cannula erythema induration palpable venous cord then you have again to recite the cannula and consider the treatment all of the following in the stage 5 there is advanced stage of thrombophlebitis you have to initiate treatment and recite the cannula of course so this was the visual infusion phlebitis score now how to assess the care bundle compliance ki kaun kitna bundle care follow bhi ho raha hai hospital mein ki nahi ho raha so this is done by daily assessment of peripheral intravascular care necessity that is through surveillance and audits you should be used to better monitor both practice and outcome and we have to conduct monthly patient safety meetings to discuss issues with compliance now we have uh, uh, we have seen that implementation of different care bundles uh, leading to reduced pvc bsi rates so this is indeed very important part of the peripheral intravascular catheter care now there are various tools designed by every hospital all over the world point of poc must means point of care tools which uh, assess the uh, a quality of the bundle care given to the patient that is one one of them is the i decided this is iv assessment and decision tool i is for identify d is for does and e is for effective function so many uh, type of poc tools are there 
second one is the pib 5 rights pib 5 rights means the p stands for right proficiency i is for right insertion v is for right vein 5 is right 5 supplies and technology r is for right review so this is another tool by some other hospital then in children there are um, to reduce the incidence of pibc complications there is a very complicated care bundle um, in which to improve the pibc insertion we have success this is uh, success. It stands uh, for skills of inserter, U for understanding and prepare for patient, and so on. And another one is the PIVCS, that is prompt removal, inspect early. This is for PIVC management. <clears throat> so uh, in the PI PIVC management, we have to use clean hands, strictly aseptic, non-touch techniques, ANTT. And one of the protocol is scrub the hub protocol. protocol. The, that technique is very important and treat PIVCs with as much respect as you do with central venous catheters. So this was another POC care tool. Then um, now coming on to the central venous catheter. We have discussed the peripheral venous catheters. Now I'll be talking about the central venous catheter. Um, Dr. Peter Pruner was same. He was developed a checklist for inser insertion and management of central venous catheters as well. And central venous catheter related complications, they cost a significant cost burden to the hospital and increased hospital days. And you must all be aware with, of the indications of the central venous catheters for it is used for central venous pressure monitoring, monitoring of the hemodynamic variables, volume resuscitation, infusion of the hyperalimentation, chemotherapy, cardiac catheterization and repeated blood sampling and where the peripheral intravenous access is very uh, less chances of peripheral venous. And there are very types of uh, central venous cannulas. The, these can be classified into non-tunneled and the tunneled one. Tunneled ones are the long term. This figure shows this, the tunneled cannulas. So non-tunneled include the PIC or the long term catheters, the PA catheters and the tunneled ones include the implanted port and the permacath catheters. Uh, so the complications of central venous catheters, these are, this can be classified into acute, that is encountered during insertion of the central venous cannulas. These are mainly mechanical and vascular, that is um, the arterial or the venous injuries. And delayed uh, complications, they lead to infections or the clabsies I'll be discussing further. Infectious complications, these can be classified into tunnel infection, the tunneled catheter, the exit site infection, and the central line associated bloodstream infection, which is very deadly, clabsy. Then the PIC catheter compl um, complication, this is another type of catheter and there is no difference in the rate of bloodstream infection between traditional central venous catheters and the PIC lines. So same rate of CLABSI infection is encountered in PIC catheter as well. So what is CLABSI? CLABSI is central line associated bloodstream infection. Uh, it appears in the presence of a central line or within 48 hours of removal of it and it cannot be attributed to an infection unrelated to the catheter and attributable mortality from CLABSI is 12 to 25 percent. So the bloodstream infections attributed to vascular catheters, it is uh, found out that uh, the percutaneous tunneled long-term venous central venous catheter, this accounts for 22.5 percent of all the bloodstream infections. And pathogenesis of CLABSI, this can, uh, the, I'll be uh, discussing further the contaminated catheter hub, that is this one, the uh, contaminated catheter hub is one of the source of endogenous skin flora and uh, pathogenesis of CLABSIs can be, it is one of the known cause of pathogenesis of CLABSIs. <clears throat> so uh, this is a landmark cohort study with, that, that was published in December 28, 2006 and it recommended certain evidence-based recommendations to decrease the incidence of CLABSIs. So various working groups uh, were uh, working on it and they finally implemented the bundled strategies that is for central line insertion and the maintenance bundle. As we have discussed that the, there were two elements of care during insertion and the ongoing maintenance. Similarly, it's with central line also. Central line insertion bundles are different and the central line maintenance bundles are different. So this is an important tool, the care bundle for the insertion of IV access. One it is the catheter type during the insertion of intravenous axis we have to take into account the catheter type we have to use a central venous catheter with a minimum number of lumens up just say you central line dial you say that three lumens wala mangao two lumens wala mangao so it should be with minimum number of lumens required then insertion site any insertion site 
subclavian, internal jugular, and femoral veins are all suitable sites for CVC insertion. And where indicated, the site should be prepared using surgical clippers and not the razors. We have to have to clear the uh, hair sometimes, but we don't have to use the razors. It should be done with surgical clippers. Then thirdly, use maximum aseptic barrier precautions when inserting CVC. That is, I've already discussed, use with uh, complete personal protective equipment, PPE, and use the correct hand hygiene procedure before and after inserting the CVC. The fourth one is the skin preparation, which is to be done with uh, chloropep, that is 2% chlorhexidine with 70% isopropyl alcohol as with peripheral intravenous cannula. A fifth one is the dressing, that semi-permeable, semi, uh, uh, semi transparent dressing should be there. And we have to document all the insertion details in patient notes. That is, you have to put the notes of while inserting the central venous catheter. Now, these are the these were the insertion bundles. The maintenance bundles to reduce the clapsy rates are the components of post-insertion care education included, the hand hygiene, while handling the CVCs, that is, when you want to give the fluids, you want to give the drugs, you have to uh, maintain the strict asepsis protocol, hand hygiene, proper procedures for catheter side dressing changes as well. Then proper procedures for CVC manipulation. When you're manipulating the CVC, you have to maintain proper hygiene and proper procedures for infusate preparation as well. Then uh, another maintenance bundle suggests assess daily whether catheter is needed. You have to monitor daily whether the CVC cannula should be there in situ or you have to take it out. The catheter side care should be done with uh, no iodine ointment. You should not use iodine there. Use a chlorhexidine gluconate scrub to sites for dressing changes. 30 second scrub and 30 second air dry. You must air dry the site. Then change gauze dressings every two days unless they are soiled, dampened, or loosened. You have to change the gauze dressings, the gauze which you uh, put for even if there is any ooze or blood. Then you should change the gauze dressing every two days and change the clear dressings every seven days unless they are soiled, dampened, or loosened. So two and seven, these figure you should keep in mind. Then a uh, word about the central venous catheters, avoid routine placement of CVCs. So you should avoid routine replacement of CVCs. Subclavian site minimizes the infection risk for non-tunneled CVC placement. And there is as such no recommendation for a tunneled CVC. You have to use antimicrobial impregnated CVC with minimum number of ports. The, ca the catheter should be antimicrobial impregnated. Use Teflon or polyurethane catheters associated with fewer infectious complications and promptly remove any intravascular catheter that is no longer essential. And daily review of continued need for CVC with the help of multidisciplinary team rounds. Okay, you should have multidisciplinary. Then uh, where there is difficult venous access, the, uh, the, uh, the cannula should be put under ultrasound guidance, which is the standard of care these days and useful in patients with difficult anatomy and average access time is reduced. So a word about hand hygiene and aseptic technique, which we have been discussing in the whole uh, slides, the perform hand hygiene procedures either by washing hands with conventional soap and water or with alcohol based hand rubs. The full barrier precautions, that means the full protective, pro, pro, personal protective equipment with uh, mask, gown, gloves, cap, and broad draping. And scrub the hub. You should never uh, forget this. Scrub the hub protocol. First step is the hand hygiene. Use You can use sanitizer or soap and water before in accessing the line. Second one is the 15 second hub scrub. Third one is the 15 second air dry. Air dry, you should never forget. You should don't, never put the uh, dressing on the wet surface. Then fourth one is the maintain ANTT. ANTT is aseptic non-touch technique. So this is the scrub the herb protocol. Now the types of various dressings using the central venous catheters. This is, uh, there are various type of dressing. First is the first generation occlusive standard polyurethane SPU dressings. Then uh, in the recent advancements, we have semi-permeable to oxygen, carbon dioxide and water vapor. That is Opside 4 and Tagaderm. Tagaderm we must be aware of. Everyone must be aware of this. Then bordered polyurethane to maximize catheter security and tegaderm advance. Then uh, there comes the medication impregnated dressings. That is chlorhexidine gluconate impregnated CGI dressing or the silver impregnated and iodine impregnated dressings as well. And finally, the hydrocolloid dressings. Now there are various dressing regimens for the central venous cannulation purpose. You have to use sterile gauzes, sterile transparent semi-permeable dressing. Use gauze dressings uh, when there is any diaphoresis or bleeding or oozing. 
रिप्लेस द गॉस ड्रेसिंग साइट एवरी टू डेज रिप्लेस ट्रांसपेरेंट ड्रेसिंग एटलीस्ट एवरी सेवन डेज देन टू एंड सेवन एक्सेप्ट इन द पीडियाट्रिक पेशेंट रिप्लेस द ट्रांसपेरेंट ड्रेसिंग टनल्ड और इम्प्लांटेड सीबीसी साइट नो मोर देन वंस पर वीक so a new long term central catheter can be placed at a new anatomic site for sometimes it, it so happens that ki 10 din ho gaye aapko change karna hai site this is not a routine ab hum aisa nahi karte hain a new long term central venous catheter can be placed at a new anatomic site after 72 hours of effective antibiotic treatment in terms of uh, when whenever there is a uh, chance of clabsy so uh, the future scope the bundle redesigning system is there the future of iv bundles should focus on improving the wider spectrum of clinical outcomes associated with bundles being integrated in everyday practice and implementing evidence based tools that is uh, the tools can be obtained on the whatsapp groups or the uh, ipads and so on to conclude iv catheter care is an everyday clinical procedure that will benefit from redefined bundle implementation key to the bundle design is necessity to deliver interventions into a real world setting assured bundle compliance is needed religiously we should adhere to protocols techniques checklists and technologies that improve patient safety along with surveillance and audits regularly practice evidence based guidelines to reduce complication rate and multidisciplinary team approach is the appropriate management for this so thank you biv wise Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for the wonderful presentation, and thank you for making us remember that the small things also matter. Uh, and it is not only the ICU; it is the ward also where we should take care of everything. We generally take care of all the central line insertions, but we never encounter the peripheral venous catheters, which are classic earlier. So we never take into account all these complications. I myself have studied so much of bundle adherence protocols first time, so it took me nice. very large amount. Thank you, thank you very much. I uh, would invite some questions, maybe. Like many times, patient have fractures and all. We cannot give PVC. Then, then we have to go for the central line. Central line for what is all right. But to many times, access to <coughs> any peripheral venous catheter ultimately we have to go for, especially in the setting of ICU. So at present scenario, we don't have central line access in the. So, uh, cut down. Uh, Venous cardone is an option, obviously. I would like to comment one thing. So there is a Hagen Poiseuille's law, which I was asking Dr. Pooja to comment on. So whenever in emergency you are putting an IV excess, and in emergency mostly you require it for IV excess is required for a resuscitation. So according to the Hagen Poiseuille's law, they say that the central line is not supposed to be inserted. It is the peripheral line because it is a shorter length and wide bore. while the catheter has a longer length and a narrow bore so in case of shock or emergency never think of a insertion of a central line you should always go ahead with a wide bore 18 gauze peripheral cannula and when once the patient has uh, the uh, resuscitation is complete and you require a prolonged iv access either to correct any electrolyte abnormality or for nutrition or for what else then you can definitely think of putting a central line thank you Uh, I thank ma'am for the enlightening thank presentation you. enhancing the depth and value of our conference discussions I request Dr Ashish Gupta to felicitate ma'am Now please join me in welcoming Dr Atul Joshi from Fortis Hospital Mohali as our next speaker for the session on introduction to laparoscopic surgery. Yeah, uh, good afternoon sir. Uh, Dr Atul Joshi uh, Sharma Joshi he is in uh, Fortis Mohali and he has done his MBBS from GMC Patiala 1991 PG in general surgery from PGI Chandigarh 
and then uh, basic and advanced courses in laparoscopic surgery from JAM Institute, Coimbatore. Uh, he has been awarded the fellowship in laparoscopic surgery by the Association of Many Multi-Access Surgeons of India. And his areas of interest include general surgery, general and laparoscopic surgery, and robotic surgery. Thank you, sir, for coming. We welcome you. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I must apologize at the very outside for my bad throat. Uh, it is uh, sheer luck. And uh, the grace and the affection with uh, this uh, you know, organization, AIMS Mohali, has invited me over, that it was almost irresistible not to be part of this effort. Uh, at the very uh, beginning, I must congratulate you, uh, the organizers, and of course, extend uh, my grateful, uh, you know, regards to all of them for taking on this effort, and uh, they have worked so hard for all these months. Because I, I remember getting this invite a couple of months back. Uh, had I known that I would have a bad throat four months down the line, I would uh, probably have said no. Uh, thank you so much, uh, the organizers, and thank you all of you. Um, it is it is difficult uh, post lunch to be awake for an academic session. Uh, all of you are, which is which is very heartening. Uh, my my topic is uh, introduction to laparoscopic surgery, which is which is strange in a way. Why I would say strange because uh, I am from relatively from the old school, uh, as my credentials they mentioned. I'm a 91 batch uh, pass out. That means I'm 86 batch. So I got trained in open surgery. So. The changeover from an open surgery to minimal access or robotic or, or to laparoscopic surgery was, was a paradigm shift for my generation. Uh, you know, uh, when I was training, the bigger the surgeon, the bigger was the incision. Now, th the bigger the surgeon, the smaller is the incision. So for me, it was a generational shift. And uh, uh, we would, you know, very commonly discussed amongst ourselves that we are learning open surgery and laparoscopic surgery. What is interesting is when I thought that I was good at laparoscopic surgery, then the robotics, they come over. And then you, you know, de-learn, re-learn and re-re-learn all over again. Why I am saying it is a challenge to speak on laparoscopic surgery? Because it's been uh, roughly 27, 30 years since laparoscopy came into being and we have come to accept it as a standard of care. This is a diverse uh, audience. Uh, students, uh, I, I guess they are from nursing side also, technician side also, am I right? So it is a diverse, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. For the experts, it may you may find that it is too basic, but that is my mandate. Because once I say, I'm going to introduce you to laparoscopic surgery, I'm going to stick to basics. Would somebody guide me how to navigate this? Because it is not running for my laptop. Okay. So all improvements, uh, they say, are transitory and illusionary if knowledge 
experience and skills, they cannot be transmitted to the future generation. That is all of you, of practitioners of art and science of surgery. This was said roughly about 500 for 100 years ago, and it is relevant even today. We may be talking of uh, general surgery, laparoscopic surgery, or robotic surgery, but this art and craft has to be passed on. All new innovations, they have to be passed on to the next generation. Otherwise, they will cease to have a meaning. The universal acceptance of laparoscopic surgery is because this surgery is so much kinder to the patients in many, many ways. I remember uh, in my times when I was a student, I was your age, doing a standard procedure like a cholecystectomy used to be a big deal. There were many factors. One factor was there was no easy availability of an ultrasound. You may be taking ultrasound for granted, but it also took its own time to come into being. Diagnosing a simple gallbladder used to be a tough ask. And I remember in our days, there used to be what we used to call as OCGs, oral cholecystographies. We used to give a patient a contrast to drink, turn the table over and over again, and look for complications related to gallstones. There was no sing single, simple, straightforward test to diagnose a gallstone disease. And trust you me, that operating upon a gallstone was again a, was a tough uh, task. I remember standing over the shoulders of my colleagues trying to see what is going on inside. Ten of us all around the table, and no wonder that operation theater is known as a theater, because we would all crowd around the patient trying to get a glimpse of what is happening, which only the teacher could see clearly. And those patients, they were in a mess for surgery again. Ryle's tube hanging out of their nose, a drain hanging out of your body, a catheter in situ, in severe pain, and then soakage from the main wound as well as from the drain site. So it is, it is not that, that we have come to regard laparoscopic surgery as, as a panacea or something which, is, which has come from the outside world. No, it is the simplicity of the procedure and the way it has transformed the patient care and comfort. That is why it has earned its place. It was George Kelling from Germany who did the first laparoscopy incidentally on a dog. They would not let him touch a human being. And he named it celioscopy. And if you go through the German literature, it is also known as colioscopy or celioscopy. So he was one inquisitive mind that he wanted to see without opening the whole tummy of a or a maybe animal in this, uh, in this episode. Is there... I mean, what does it look like? So he was the pioneer who thought out of the box and attempted to look inside the cavity of an animal. And then it wasn't a smooth sailing. Uh, it took first clinical laparoscopy in man in 1910. And it, he, he used to do more of thoracoscopies, less of laparoscopies, but he did publish his 10 years experience of uh, probably 110 procedure in 72 patients, and when the world took notice that here is something which is being attempted, and let's see. But of course, whenever there is a, a new um, you know, proposition or a new advent, we see it with a lot of suspicion that is human nature. So he was also ridiculed. And then very neatly packed inside. So once you put in a scope inside, how do you see inside when there is no space? So it was... Uh, tested the use of carbon dioxide after much research because till that time we were still struggling to find out how to create that space. Would it be air? Would it be nitrogen? Would it be something else? Because you had to have a substance or a gas which was not inflammable, which was not toxic to the body, which would be accepted and it will give you space as well. The risk of air embolism with air, and other things which were tried, and it actually uh, started from there to create some space because you need a working space to put your scopes inside, your instruments inside. And then, how do you see inside? The first, our initial scientists, they were reflecting light with a mirror to guide it inside and try to see what is happening inside. So, 
even uh, you know devising the lenses or the light sources was was a big big ask in those initial days and how do you end the enter inside if you put a scope inside or put a cystoscope they started uh, to uh, to begin with which was which was invented in the beginning of 19th century and then you you re, you realize how do you go inside once you go inside the moment you come out you have to you know negotiate that hole once all over again so the trocars were developed next and then it was this hungarian scientist who devised that beautiful veris needle which we commonly use nowadays it is a blunt tip needle it has a sharp edge as it enters the tummy the sharp edge comes into play the moment it it is inside the peritoneal cavity the blunt edge it comes out and the internal organs they are safe please understand the distance between the posterior layer of the anterior abdominal wall and the retroperitoneum is not more than 2 to 2 2.5 cm so you are actually working in a space which is dangerous if you are not careful enough and laparoscopic surgery in the 60s and 70s it became very popular but among the gynecologists they were doing a lot many more procedures than than general surgeons be it ovarian procedures be it adhesiolysis i mean basic procedures but it was more popular among the gynecologists and the surgeons they were lagging far far behind and it was kurt kurt sem again he is a he is a gynecologist who did the first laparoscopic appendectomy in 1980 and again because he was a gynecologist he was very well adapted in pelvic procedures so uh, probably he found uh, a inflamed appendix and he thought okay let me try it on if i can i can manage it with laparoscopy and he was advised the brain scan by his colleagues he was told a brain damaged person would perform laparoscopic surgery so just 50 years from now we are talking of 1980 when he was condemned criticized almost ridiculed for what he was attempting to do and it was eric muhe who performed the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy in 12th of september 1985 he did a couple of procedures but he uh, after that he also uh, you know got ridiculed he was probably uh, uh, a civil case was registered against him etc etc and then it it was uh, philip morey who performed the first video assisted laparoscopic cholecystectomy in 1987 so it was march the 17th 1987 when this path breaking procedure was done and as they say it has been a profound epidemiological leap before that there was nothing and after that there was laparoscopic surgery he's uh, philip more he had come down to india i remember being with him uh, the person next to me is one of my teachers probably you must have seen him in the morning session dr kaman was there in the morning so it is him and i remember dr kaman telling me that this is going to be your defining moment of your life standing next to the person who did the first laparoscopic cholecystic to me and again this was an accident it it was an accident in the sense that he had to perform a gynecological procedure and the lady insisted that i have a gallbladder disease if you can combine both the procedures together he resentfully agreed and then the next day when he went to see the patient he was surprised when the lady said i told you to do my gallbladder along with you, which you did not do and i have to come back again and she was ready to go home this was the next day of the surgery after a gynecological procedure and a laparoscopic cholecystectomy combined so that is why this this terse statement that before that there was nothing and there was there was nothing was there. after that there was laparoscopic surgery the concept as i said in the beginning that big surgeons make big incisions was discarded minimally, minimally invasive surgery had arrived was here to stay and now the next generation is the robotics and the nano robotics what is the hardware involved if i am talking about introduction to the proscopic surgery there is a lot of hardware and software which is involved then there is a in the endovision system we have a telescope 
there is a scope kind of a thing which goes inside the tummy and at the end of the telescope there is a camera which is going to send us the visuals we can't send the camera inside because it becomes too bulky and then the this picture is projected on the monitor from within the peritoneal cavity and this is this is what makes the endovision system uh this is the monitor this is the insufflator this is the camera head and this is the light source so this is the hardware which forms part of the endovision system and this is the cautery apparatus with which we uh, cauterize the blood vessels and the and the tissues inside and then for the endovision system we need a light source again light source has been not easy to attain we started in the beginning of 19th century with cystoscopes which had a platinum loop which was to be which was very hot you had to protect the viscera from it and from the cystoscopes we came to the light sources it started with incandescent light it started with fluorescent lights then uh, halogen bulbs then xenon bulbs now the led has come to stay and then there has been some changes in the uh, the cables which bring the light from the light source to inside the peritoneal or the chest cavity or where wherever we are using the camera system for and these can be fiber optic cables and these can be liquid crystal gel cables as well so the a lot of research lot of perfection lot of further research is going on into all those systems and then there is an insufflator which i showed you because you need to fill it fill up the cavity with some kind of a gas which can give you space to work in so you need a various needle to create a pneumoperitoneum you need cannulas to enter in my case a peritoneal cavity in thoracoscopy uh, you need in the chest cavity and and all sorts of applications wherever you need to enter you need to enter with a various you can go with an open technique also but that is another a field of discussion but cannulas are there and then trocars and then all instruments they are not of the same size some instruments are 5 mm so they are small indeed some are 3 mm some are some are 10 mm and the new age stapler can be 12 mm or 15 mm also so you need a cannula which can accommodate those instruments and for smaller size in instruments you need a sleeve what what we call as a reducer and then there are uh, hand instruments proper so this is uh, can i have a pointer please can i have a pointer with you okay i'll show you so on the top uh, those are open instruments Uh, this these are the cannulas which i i was talking about this is 10 mm cannula cannula with a trocar and uh, these are 5 mm cannulas this is a disposable cannula with trocar these are the lens uh, which i was talking about uh, these are the instruments some of these are 10 mm in diameter and these are the smaller ones 5 mm you you see these minuscules uh, dissector soft graspers and uh, these are the open instruments uh, which have been kept on the trolley so these are the hand instruments which i was talking about so this is uh, the process of creation of pneumoperitoneum we have made a nick at the above or around the umbilicus this is the various needle which is going in once it is inside the peritoneal cavity we check the position whether we are inside we first aspirate if it is in a blood vessel or in the intestine the contents will be different and then we drop in the saline to what we call as a hanging drop method and then we connect the gas so this is the carbon dioxide gas the the needle what i described is a various needle so this is the various needle technique of entering the abdomen
So once the pneumoperitoneum is there, the, the trocar is being put. This is the cannula with the trocar. This is a sharp edge trocar. It is pyramidal in shape. It can be conical. It can be uh, other shapes as well. So once it is inside, we check the escape of the gas, connect the gas again, and then put in the scope. So this is a monitor. Uh, this is a light shadow, excuse me for this. And this is the inside. This is the stomach. This is, these are the gut loops covered with momentum. I'm going towards the pelvis side, doing a check all around, check for any injury inadvertent if there is. This is the liver, and some, somewhere here is the gallbladder. So what would be a carry-home message uh, after this introduction? Uh, the carry-home message is laparoscopy has rapidly been the gold standard procedure for many surgeries. You name a procedure, you can do, do it with laparoscopy. The toughest of procedures, they have been tackled with laparoscopy. Advances in hardware as well as software, are, is, it's a continuous process. I remember when on my laparoscopic journey, the visuals were not very clear. If I compare it with the ones today, today we are talking of 4K, 4K Ultra. We used to have a very, very basic vision. Uh, the cameras, uh, the resolution wasn't very good. When laparoscopy came in India, they did not have medical grade monitors. They used to put small television sets on, on, uh, on a table and perform the surgeries. So there is a lot of development in hardware as well as in software. It is not, uh, it is like probably an, an iPhone. When you think that you've had the best of it, a newer model comes. So the advances in minimal access have, have evolved into robotic surgery now. That is the New Horizon, and last but not the least, open surgery is not obsolete, it's still an option. It, it may still be a go-to procedure in case you are in trouble. So I thank you all of, all of you uh, for your patient listening, and uh, I must thank Dr. Kavita, all the organizers, Dr. Ashish, and the faculty, and the a director principal who I know since I was probably 17 years of age uh, to have invited me over for this. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. It was very crisp and to the point, and I hope everybody have loved it. I would like to uh, have some questions if anybody has any. What is the take on that? How do you I totally agree with you. It is a challenge. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there is hardly a, a routine gallbladder, hernia, I mean, general surgery where we, we, we hardly convert. With our experience, we have learned to tackle, you know, all kind of problems, difficulties, uh, with laparoscopy, that is that is one. Uh, I remember when I was training in PGI, uh, even before putting in the ports, my teacher would come and whisper in my ear, "Mujhe lagta hai convert ho jayega." You know that was the level of uh, fear which we had. So now, even if we think it it may need to be converted, we usually do not. And uh, I must say with uh, some pride that probably the volumes in India for the surgeon, average surgeon in India, is, they are so high that their proficiency and their skill is probably at a, another level. But I totally second your point that in case a present generation, which is trained in laparoscopy and they're good at it, they need to convert, they are in a trouble. In that case, you will have to look for a gray haired person. Same was my uh, question to you that uh, we are now performing laparoscopic surgery in all the patients. But when it comes to conversion to open, we find it very much difficult because nowadays we are performing less of the open surgeries. These days, the young budding uh, 
surgeons or the medical professional when they see it is very fascinating for them to get a hands on the laparoscopic surgery should they first uh, be trained in an open surgery and then they should because they are not uh, expert or experienced surgeons and i mean you are talking about your experience which is at at another level but what about the uh, young professionals who are just at the beginning of their career should they first master the skills of an open surgery and then go ahead with the laparoscopic surgery um i i said it's a challenge why i said it's a challenge because where would they do an open surgery now the patient doesn't want it the surgeon is not happy offering it to the patient and the mobility the open surgery brings is 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 formidable to say the least that is number 1 number 2 uh, your point uh, when we convert we find it very difficult please understand when you are converting you are already converting a difficult patient and a difficult surgery does not become easier with open you know in laparoscopy you have an advantage of visuals of magnification with fantastic uh, uh, retraction uh, you know small instruments ye sare advantages jo hain wo laparoscopy mein hai and the laparoscopic vision is better than an open uh, vision so while you are converting you are already in a deep deep trouble and you are getting into probably further trouble so never think that conversion is going to make it easy it is not going to be easy if it is tough laparoscopically it is going to be tougher open robotic has a huge advantage in vision the visuals are fantastic and please understand it is three dimensional it is a 3d vision the problem with robotic is there is no touch in laparoscopy you still have a touch perception somewhat it may be truncated in robotic you are sitting far away from the patient so you have no touch perception you are relying only on the visuals but the visuals are fantastic they don't leave anything to chance that is the advantage but all systems they have their advantages and disadvantages there is no easy answer how to teach the present generation the open surgery because there is no open surgery which you can offer as a matter of routine to any of your patients so they'll have to learn the hard way as and when the patient gets opened up so a uh, few of my residents are here in the audience so i i remember i i see them whenever there is an open surgery they are in cloud nine you know i i feel disheartened ki i have to do an open procedure for example there is a polytrauma patient he is in shock and you are you know you know carrying the trolley to the ot in the middle of the night and then you are doing an open procedure so but it may be hard on me but they are happy every time because the, the procedures are so few and far between whenever it it happens as i remember my student days i was operating in an emergency ot in pgi and one of my colleagues who's a very famed plastic surgeon in my hospital he was training in plastic surgery so he came to see me from outside and say nothing like the touch of an intestine you know so that touch is not there in laparoscopy or in robotics any other questions from the audience thank you then we move on to the next session uh sir i would invite me. dr ashish to felicitate Uh, now I invite next. Dr. Ashish, Assistant Professor, Department of Surgery, AIMS, Mohali. Sir, we will be speaking on surgical tubes and catheters, the lifelines. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we will introduce Dr. Ashish Gupta. Uh, 
he is affiliated to the B R Ambedkar State Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, his achievements include 24 international publications, three book chapters. He's a speaker at various conferences, and his area of interest include minimal invasive surgery, medical education, and HPV surgery. Thank you, Dr. Ashish. Stage is yours. Thank you. Good evening. So uh, my topic is uh, surgical catheters and tubes. So basically, it's a wide topic. So I have truncated my topic towards uh, Riles tubes your drain management systems and urinary catheters. So we'll be talking in short about surgical tubes they uses, the maintenance part of it and how to fix it and when to remove those tubes. So uh, this is a common scenario which we encounter in our emergencies uh, or even in ICUs. So he's a 46 year old male with a head injury uh, persistently on ventilator. So he requires feeding for his weaning and energy requirements so what to do with this patient how to start the feeding on this patient so this is our index case we'll just try to build on this so coming on to the feeding so uh, let's understand what our what our stomach uh, stomach does when we start thinking of feeding and when we actually feed so when we start chewing and swallowing the food bolus so there the stomach dilates the reservoir part of the stomach will it will dilate and it will try to accommodate more uh, food or the bolus which is entering into it so this is called as receptive relaxation so uh, and then when the food actually enters the stomach the stomach dilates and that is called as the adaptive relaxation so for feeding part uh, we will try to concentrate on this area which is called as the pylorus of the stomach so the area which is pre-pylorus means it is before the pylorus, it, is, it will be called as pre-pyloric area. And the area which will be after this pylorus it is post-pyloric area. So if the pylorus is it is basically a sphincter which is preventing the gastric emptying. If it is uh, constricted, then the stomach will be filled, the food will not go So when we rise tube, it will enter the stomach. Jo bhi hum rice tube feeding dete hain ya rice tube se feed karte hain, wo stomach mein hi rehti hai. Or it will require its time for gastric emptying depending upon the various factors. Agar patient sick hai ya koi drugs aisi chal rahi hai jisse ki gastric motility kam ho rahi hai, to wo food yahan pe jada der tikega. Well, it will be more, uh, it will be staying long, for long over this period. So we'll we'll have to allow a time to for this bolus to pass into the intestines. So, but whenever the feed is post pyloric, we can give a continuous infusion, but that also will depend upon the intestinal activity, intestinal peristalsis, and intestinal accommodation of the food. This is not that the intestine is not working or you are feeding it, post pyloric, but the abdomen will bloat up. The abdomen will be distended and the patient will feel discomfort. What will happen here? If pre pyloric feed is not working, the patient will vomit it out. You have vomiting, nahi hogi, but patient will have, will have discomfort. So as a nursing practitioner, ya as a nursing care giver, what we'll have to do? When you give the tube feeding, dete hai, you give it in boluses. We'll divide the whole requirement of the whole day on, over a period of time into boluses. Like 200 ml, 300 ml bolus. Then we'll stop for another 2-3 hours. We'll give time for the passage of bolus. Then again, we'll give the second feed. So this is how rice tube feeding is given. But for the post pyloric feed, like feeding jejunostomy, karte hai, feeding jejunostomy mein hum, we can give a continuous infusion, but still we have to look for abdominal distension, abdomen pain. Na? So, so, what are the feeding routes? The feeding routes will be your rice tube, which uh, it's a silicon based tube, just a radio opaque marker. Hota hai. Hai? Again, the the same law which uh, Dr. Kavita told in the last talk, jitna white bore hoga, utna flow rate jada hoga. So that is, uh, that holds true here itself, here also. The length of the tube is usually measured from the tip of the nose from, to the triggers of the uh, ear and then from there to the ziphy sternum. This is the length of the tube which has to be inserted into the abdomen of the patient. So how to check the rice tube? It is simple way. Just either you can take an x-ray or you can just put the bell of the stethoscope over the epigastric vent just give a bolus of air through this open end. And if it is there, the third is, 
heard then you can just uh, you know that this is in the abdomen so the other ways which are being um, used these days are percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy peg and the feeding jejunostomy which can be done either surgically or percutaneously both so it is the same thing long flexible tube but its maintenance is cumbersome yahan pe naak mein dikkat kar rahi hai pharynx mein dikkat kar rahi hai and even the patient is like feeling very difficult to keep it in position theek hai so it can cause blockage of eustachian tube causing otitis media pharyngitis is a common problem and even it can cause aspiration because ye jo aapka cardioesophageal junction hai this is also opened up all the time because of the tube within it so all the gastric contents can easily pass through your g junction and then it it can enter your pharynx so this also promotes aspirations so this th this thing is better abdomen mein ek tube hai wahan se feeding chal rahi hai but this 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 feed also enters the same pathway as of rice tube but this is more acceptable to the patient so this is being performed in good centers this is being uh, offered these days so for tubes always check for the right place aspirate the content before starting the new bolus so iska kya matlab hai jab bhi aap naya bolus agla bolus dene jate ho 2 ghante ke baad aap pichle bolus ko ek bar aspirate karte ho agar 50% se zyada uska bolus ka aspirate aata hai to then you stop feeding it means your pylorus has your gastric entering has not happened and this patient will be prone for aspirations so always aspirate the bolus before starting the new bolus theek hai upright position mein dena hai and you should flush the tube after each bolus is given after each feed is given so that your potency of the tube is maintained theek hai it is cheap and effective way of feeding so now coming on to the urinary problem so this is another uh, common case in emergency it he is a 64 year old male with acute pain in the hypogastrium with a, such a big lump in the abdomen theek hai and on ultrasound they say hyper distended bladder and this patient gave a history of nocturia and all the lutz syndrome which was present for years together and he has ignored those symptoms and one one day fine day or one fine night he is ended up in the such a problem so what to do with this patient so you have to drain this bladder basically so for draining this bladder so there are urinary catheters which are available so urinary catheters there are three port catheters or two port catheters self retaining ones the self retaining part is the balloon which is just distal to the tip of the catheter this is the eye which drains the urine into this and the balloon is insufflated through the port which is color coded this is the universal color, color coding which is followed everywhere in the world this this can be used to know the size of the catheter or otherwise the size of the catheter is also mentioned on the on the wrapper of it यहाँ पे इस जगह पे आपको एक वॉल्यूम लिखी होती है कि जिससे ये बलून को इन्फ्लेट किया जा सकता है नॉर्मली व्हाट यू इन्फ्यूज इन इट क्या डालते हैं आप इसमें यूरिनरी कैथेटर में डिस्टल वाटर डालना चाहिए सो द वॉल्यूम ऑफ डिस्टल वाटर विच हैज टू बी इन्फ्यूज इन टू दिस पोर्ट इज ऑलरेडी मैं नॉर्मली वट वी डू इज वी यूजली डू इट विन एम एल और फिफ्टीन एम एल ऑफ साइन but it in certain depending upon the size it can go up to 30 to 40 ml also theek hai so this three, triple lumen is the similar catheter but it has three lumens one for drainage and the third lumen can be used for irrigation part of it so this is basically used for patients in patients with hematuria where the ble, the blood can come and stuck get stuck at this inlet so that that will cause the obstruction of the urine and retention of the urine again so ye irrigation wala jo port hai ye catheter ko patent rakhta hai and bladder ko bhi irrigate karta hai so catheter kai baar pass bhi nahi hota urinary catheter there suppose if there is a urethral stricture or there is a uh, narrowing at the level of urethra or the urethra the prostate is so enlarged that you cannot pass a normal footing size catheter into the male तो आप क्या करते हो डाउन साइज करते हो कैथेटर को आप यू ट्राई विदर साइज कैथेटर इवन दो फीडिंग ट्यूब्स बट अगर फीडिंग ट्यूब्स भी नहीं होती तो वॉट यू डू इज सुप्रोपियोबिक सिस्टोस्टोमी सुप्रोपियोबिक सिस्टोस्टोमी कुछ नहीं है जैसे वो उस पेशेंट में ब्लैडर पालपेबल था यू डू यू आप सुप्रोप्यूबिक मीन जस्ट अबाउट द प्यूबिस वहां पर एक इंसिजन देते हो 
again a trocar is used trocar is the thick well, sharp edge cutting instrument which you put it under the ultrasound guidance and you prick the bladder uske baad aap ek foley's catheter jo aap periurethral dal rahe the usi catheter ko aap supra pubic root se dal ke bladder ko evacuate kar dete ho and this stays for uh, as long as uh, your pathology in the uh, lower uh, urinary tract is not managed so but this can cause uh, bowel injury and bleeding bowel injury means agar aapka bladder bahut zyada inflated nahi tha ya distended nahi tha to aap you can enter into the gut or bleeding from the vessels so coming on to the management so patient in patient uh, uh, painful urinary catheterization so catheterize the bladder, bladder and drain the urine so measure the retain, retention volume check urine dipsticks blood test aap sari history lete ho admission ki indication hai ki nahi hai yell of catheter removal dete ho nahi to aap admit karte ho baki test karwate ho theek hai agar contra indications hai to surgery karte ho agar contra indications nahi hai to prostate ki dawaiyan shuru kar dete ho theek hai ji agar ye history of examination bp or bladder outlet obstruction mein nahi jati hai to cystoscopy karni hai to to evaluate for urethral structure or bladder neck stenosis aur agar wo hai to uski definitive management karenge agar wo bhi nahi hai to urodynamic study karke aap bladder dysenergia ko rule out karte ho but as we know we catheterize the patient in our hospital what we do we just catheterize the patient this is just the first step of management in patient of with acute urinary retention so this all has to be performed after the catheterization acute emergency is managed theek hai so hum ye ye nahi kehte ki catheterize kar diya aur patient theek ho gaya so ye sab karna hai uske baad kahin na kahin aapka patient baithega agar usko surgery chahiye to surgery karni hai medication chahiye medication leni hai ya jo bhi pathology hai uske hisab se aapne treat karna hai so again a third scenario a patient underwent a surgery for perforation peritonitis she had multiple collections in abdomen for which multiple tubes were placed so what are the tubes it is basically a drain theek hai ji so drain ke pehle hum uses ki baat karte hain ye chest chest drain ki baat karte hain drain sabse commonly kahan use hoti hai abdomen mein aur chest mein and even it is used in neurosurgical procedures after cranial tomes for drainage of collections plastic surgery mein agar aap flap karte ho flap ki dead space ko obliterate karne ke liye aap wahan pe ek drain rakh dete ho but the common the most common uses are in chest and abdomen so this is the normal chest this is the normal lung lined by the pleural cavity so whenever there is a injury to the rib cage or whenever there is a shear force which hits the chest bluntly or penetrate mainly bluntly so there is shear in this this causes contusion of the lung parenchyma and the bronchioles which are on the periphery of this lung they will get injured and air the air will escape from these bronchioles into the pleural cavity this is what is called as pleural uh, pneumothorax theek hai ji so so what on uh, history you the capitals will be uh, seen on the yeah it will be felt on the areas the, where the ribs are fractured so so what do you do you just put in a drain which will be from the triangle of safety it will be draining this pleural cavity so this is what uh, is done aap ye pleural cavity mein drain dal dete ho and it is attached to the water seal theek hai so agar ye water seal se attached hai so whenever the patient expires jab expire hoga lung kya hoga एक्सपायर होगा तो क्या करेगा जब ये एक्सपायर होगा तो ये एयर बाहर निकलेगी ठीक है और जब इंस्पायर होगा क्योंकि ये एयर वापस अंदर जा सकती है दिस वाटर कॉलम इफ इट इज फुल दिस विल राइज एंड प्रिवेंट द एंट्री ऑफ एयर इनटू द प्लूरल कैविटी सो दिस इज हाउ दिस सील विल फंक्शन एंड अल्टीमेटली ऑल द एयर व्हिच इज इन दिस कैविटी विल बी ड्रेन्ड आउट एंड योर लंग विल बी द पेशेंट्स लंग विल बी लाइक फुली इन्फ्लेटेड एंड after that after knowing after after a check x ray if the lung is fully inflated and there is no other associated collection we'll just remove the test tube so these are the another tubes which are jackson pratt drains hain iske basically har drain ke yahi teen part hote hain this is a reservoir which will 
which can be uh, vacuum can be created in this and it will suck all the collection which is uh, for which this tube is placed and then it has a bulb and the tube which will be the part of which will be in the patient this will be the drainage end so this is used to create vacuum as and then vacuum is created will stop this we'll put a block on this so all the collections will move in this direction into this reservoir and this can be emptied at various intervals depending upon the needs of the patient so where are the tubes required where are the drains required it helps us to know the content of the drain know the content means agar usme blood aa raha hai to it means it the patient is bleeding inside agar fecal matter aa raha hai so there is some perforation inside agar bile aa raha hai after cholecystectomy cholecystectomy so you are suspecting a biliary injury ya biliary peritonitis it helps to drain the collections and lateralize the fistulas so drain the collections mean agar wahan pe suppose a liver abscess hai usme aapne drain rakh di hai ya drain dal di hai to jo bhi wahan pe collection bani hui hai wo bahar aa jayegi so it helps in draining those collections it helps to obliterate the dead space jab aap koi ye karte hain flaps karte hain to there is a dead space potential dead space ya hernia karte hain aap ek flap raise karte ho uske beech mein mesh dal dete ho and there is a dead space which is the potential space for collection of fluid and abscess formation so this function will be helpful it prevents seruma and further abscess formations so this is just uh, an pictorial representation of the same this is the drain so this is the bulb this is a stopper again tubing you just remove the stopper press this bulb and then put it back the vacuum will be created and it will suck all the fluid which is uh, present in the abdominal cavity into this drain so how to empty it just open this stopper again put it into into the were intending to do so to document there is a color change on the first day of post op it is if there is no injury or there is nothing uh, not, there is no inward uh, complication during the surgery so how to remove this drain so drain is usually fixed with this type of suture a square knot is taken which is left little loose and then multiple square knots are given on the tube so just cut this and one end of this tube and just remove it put pull it gently and where should we dispose of this drain after removing biomedical waste in red but in red bucket yeah so when to remove drains so it will depend upon the content agar biliary fistula hai agar bile aa raha hai gut aa rahi hai aur fistula aapka lateralized hai patient theek hai you will wait for that thing to heal heal means ki jab drain output bilkul zero ho jaye tab aap nikalenge agar serious hai to aap to less than 25 ml 30 ml aa raha hai to abhi aap nikal sakte ho so depends upon the quantity also if it is more you will just like to keep it there because agar aap drain jaldi nikal denge to seruma banega then again abscess will be formed theek hai and then the biochemical analysis in certain cases like distal pancreatectomy karte ho to usme aap serum fluid amylase karwate ho agar amylase negative aata hai ya basically pancreatic fistula nahi hai then only you remove the drain if a pancreatic fistula is suspected you keep the drain for a longer period of time so all these things have to have to be taken care of before removing the drains so what are pigtail catheters so these are another type of drains which are usually used for percutaneous drainage percutaneous drainage matlab aap ultrasound karte ho bahar se hi drain dalni aap surgery ke dauran nahi dal rahe isko ultrasound karte ho liver abscess dikhi aapko ek abscess dikhi aap usme ek needle dalte ho jisko ke aap trocar bolte hain iske through aap guide wire dal dete ho then you what a catheter and attach it with the urinary bag so ye jo catheter hai ye andar rahega इसकी शेप पिग की टेल की तरह है ये पिग की टेल है द शेप इज सेम सो दैट इज व्हाई इट इज कॉल्ड एज पिग टेल कैथेटर ठीक है दिस दिस इज अ मैनूवर दिस इज अ थिंग व्हिच इज यूजुअली डन टू रिटेन दिस ट्यूब इनसाइड द कैविटी ये जो बेंड है इसको रिटेन करने के लिए यूज होता है सो दिस इज द अल्ट्रासोनिक पिक्चर हाउ इट विल लुक लाइक व्हेन इट इज इंसर्टेड परकुटेनियसली सो दीस आर द वेरियस ड्रेनेजेस कैथेटर्स एंड सक्शन ट्यूब विद दिस आई कम टू द एंड ऑफ माय top so any questions catheters and suction tube with this i come to the end of my talk so any questions thank you dr ashish it was a very nice presentation thank you very much i'll invite some questions from the audience 
any tubes you have seen but not in studio yeah. hello uh, um, i just want to ask hello uh, um, i just want to ask a question for the resident also uh, what is the role of a open drainage system as a corrugated drains nowadays open, yeah? open drainage systems are outdated well they are less commonly used nowadays yeah. but in certain cases of scrotum we are still using it but it is an invitation for pathogens only exactly so but they still in the some government institutions i have seen the many patients are being uh, they are putting the open drainage system corrugated drainage system it is cumbersome for patient also yeah. because the uh, the dressing is always wet first yes. of all and second thing you have to keep on changing the dressing and more the soakage is there more is the chances that infection will go inside your uh, yeah. even in the breast abscess cases i have seen the patients are putting that corrugated drain so there which, is no point in yeah. keeping a corrugated drain in a breast abscess or, a, yeah. or for that matter any abscess just keep the wound open that will also serve the purpose it will be equal and or for that matter any abscess just keep the wound open that will also serve the purpose it will be equal and to a corrugated drain only so there is no point of putting a suture in an inflamed tissue yes so for the resident doctors it should, it should not be the corrugated drainage is nowadays that nobody uses it and it is not recommended also so that either you do the closed drainage systems or you drain it and put a even the gauze pieces they insert inside the cavity is also wrong thing so it should not be done i have seen in many hospitals they are doing still doing it yes you had a question the question nobody so uh, i would like to ask to, uh, to the audience so as sir mentioned what is the difference between the drainage system in the chest and the uh, abdomen and why is there a difference anybody so because we want to know the inflammations in the lung so air passes so we don't have to let the air back into in the lungs so i think that's the difference what is it in is thank you sir that we often put drains we often put catheters or rials tube in a patient and sometimes it may happen so that we discharge the patient with those drains or with those catheters so it is for the interns and the surgical pgs that you should always make sure that you explain the drain care the do's and don'ts to the patient uh, <laughs> if you don't mention the patient doesn't know how to move about how to empty the drain sometimes the drain gets filled up and it gets leaks it leaks out so you should always explain the do's and don'ts and the home care of the drain or the catheter if it is used for a if the rt is inserted for a feed how to flush the rt all instruction should be mentioned should be verbally communicated to the patient as well as it should be mentioned as a written note in the discharge slip thank you A sincere thanks to our speakers and moderator for this illuminating discussion. I now call upon Dr. Ravneet to felicitate Dr. Niladri Banerji and Sukhvinder Kaur, Nursing Superintendent, to felicitate Dr. Ashish Gupta. So today we have come to the end of the session. 
and i hope you had a wonderful day today learning and listening to the various experts from the premier institute so we are now ready for the next uh, demonstration on the fourth floor for the iv access and it has been conducted by bd which is the largest uh, uh, manufacturing brand for iv access in the pick lines so we will be moving to the fourth floor now and it will be a half an hour to 45 minute sessions where you can try your hands on iv access and thereafter we will have a high tea and then we can uh, end the session today and we'll come back tomorrow with another interesting sessions thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.